Welcome to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. I'm your host, certified religious transition and trauma recovery coach, Terry Hales. I help people step out of the shadows of religious fear and shame and embrace their authentic selves with love and empathy. If you're ready to throw off the shackles of learned binary thinking and explore a more nuanced approach to life, this is your playground. Hello, and welcome back to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. In the next three episodes, we're going to be covering the most common subsets of narcissism present in religious and spiritual spaces, including in the deconstruction space. Something I've learned is just because someone is deconstructing religious doctrine doesn't necessarily mean they're also aware of or are deconstructing internalized beliefs that lead to harmful behavior patterns. And because many high-demand religions incorporate at least some teachings that promote either narcissistic traits or codependency with narcissism, it's not just possible but likely that the deconstruction space is also full of these ideas. They're just dressed differently. Some of these belief and behavior patterns may even be inside of us. And remember, that doesn't mean that we're bad people. We're people who are now beginning to heal the patterns we created in childhood to survive. And I'm including myself in this group of people. I have narcissistic traits inside of me. So do you. And you are welcome to listen for them and debunk them and confront me about them. Please, if you hear something that I'm saying or doing that feels narcissistic by all means, talk to me about that. I'm open. I want to know. I'm doing the work myself. I'm looking for those things. But you know, sometimes when you live with yourself for a long time, there are things that you miss. So if you see something in the way I'm speaking, in the way that I'm presenting knowledge, especially if I ever come across in a way that makes it seem like I'm the authority in your life, call me out. This is an open invitation, not just for this podcast episode, but for every podcast episode and every speaking engagement I am ever a part of forevermore. If you ever hear me try to take away someone else's authority or tell them what's best for their life, let me know. I am definitely not perfect. I no longer intend to try to present myself that way like I did when I was in high demand religion and I'm actually enjoying the journey of dismantling those things in my life. So please, open door. You will be welcome with your comments. Do also try to be kind. I am a human. I do have feelings, but I would love to hear from you and I would love to hear your perspective. If you see something in my behavior or language that goes against my values of curiosity non-judgment, and really wanting us to be our own authority in our life. Now, this week we are talking about the self-righteous narcissist. And for those of you who identify like I do as a recovering perfectionist, you may find that this subset really resonates. Now, before we start digging into this information, let's talk about self-care. If you find that shame starts coming up or guilt starts coming up as you're listening to this podcast, those are indicators that some of this may have been in your past. Some of these traits are resonating with you. And that's okay. This is self-awareness. Shame and guilt are coming up. They're bringing self-awareness with them. Pause the podcast and care for those pieces of yourself. Guilt will say, oh, the way I used to act is out of alignment with who I want to be. It's out of alignment with what I value or how I want people to feel around me. So this is one of those times where you've learned better now. And the reason you're able to look back with guilt is because you've grown and changed. So sit with that. 
Allow yourself to recognize that you've grown. Allow yourself to really hold the piece of yourself that feels maybe heartsick that you've hurt others and listen for what it wants to do to make amends. This is something you can do with guilt. Now, if shame is coming up, which is this feeling of I'm a bad person because I behaved this way, especially if you feel yourself wanting to hide or avoid the rest of the podcast because it feels so painful to see these traits inside of yourself, pause for a moment, as long as that moment needs to be, if it needs to be, you know, a couple of minutes, even if it needs to be a day, sit with yourself and hold that piece of yourself that feels defensive, that piece of yourself that feels unworthy, that piece of yourself that wants to run and hide. Hold that piece of yourself. Ask it questions. Help it feel safe. Bring curiosity to the table. Remember, this is not a judgmental place. No matter how severe your narcissistic traits, you are worthy of love and belonging. You may have been hurting people. You may have been hurting people severely, but you are capable of changing your beliefs and behavior, and you're capable of being accountable and making amends. And whether or not people in your past can lower their walls and let you back in or not, you're also capable of creating new relationships from this more healthy place. All hope is not lost. So whatever comes up, sit with it, hold it. If you're feeling shame, and you need help, hire a professional. A therapist can help you through this. Or if you have a friend that can sit with you and empathize with you, this means they're using their ears more than their mouth. They're listening to understand you without judgment. They want to hear you. And then they want the very best things for you. They will validate you as well as help you hold yourself accountable. This is the kind of friend we're looking for. A lot of us don't necessarily have these kinds of friends, which is why I recommended a therapist first, especially if we're coming from high demand religion. Many of us have a hard time with empathy sometimes. Many of us have a hard time with non-judgmental listening. So if those things are coming up, with shame often comes up some fear as well. Hold yourself, give yourself the time you need to calm and comfort yourself, and then come back to the podcast. Now, who is the self-righteous narcissist? So we already talked a little bit about the perfectionistic traits, but these are people who derive the attention, admiration, and validation they need to appease their childhood self-worth and attachment wounds by maintaining themselves as a morally superior person. They're usually rigid. So what does that mean? They're a person who can't or won't change their mind based on reason or facts. They cannot accept change. They're unwilling to compromise. They're often dogmatic. They believe that their beliefs and way of doing things are incontrovertibly true or right. And they're often legalistic. That means that they strictly adhere to a law or rules no matter what. They're often moralistic, which is a practice of applying judgments to yourself and to others. It often leads to people being uncharitable in the judgments they make of others. So moralistic means that you have this like strict moral code that you hold yourself to, but not just yourself, which would be okay. But you hold others to that code, whether they know about the code or not, and you judge them harshly when they don't line up with your strict moral code. We see this everywhere in society right now. They're often closed off to other perspectives, opinions, and ways of being. And they'll likely dismiss or discard anyone they believe isn't as upstanding as they are or leads the kind of moral life they believe they live. So they can be very elitist. And this elitism is actually a protective device. It keeps them from 
being exposed to other ideas, perspectives, opinions, beliefs that might contradict their own. They can be preachy. They often disregard boundaries to tell you how you should be living your life, whether or not you've consented to that conversation. They're often stingy with money, time, love, and affection. They can come across as really cold, maybe even robotic sometimes. They especially hate spending any of these things, money, time, love, and affection, on activities or people they see as frivolous or simply for the purpose of pleasure and enjoyment. These types of narcissists are often really confusing to those both outside and inside of the relationship because they don't follow the pattern of your regular run-of-the-mill grandiose narcissist. From the outside, they look like upright, upstanding people who have their crap together, and they seem like they've figured out adulting. So especially those of us who come from chaotic backgrounds that weren't very stable, these are the people who look like they've got life figured out. These are the people that are loyal. They follow through with their commitments. They remember birthdays. They send thank you cards. They're often incredibly responsible with finances. And they'll legalistically or almost robotically follow through on anything they've decided is quote unquote right. So whether it's eating a certain diet or praying at certain times of day or gathering the family to make memories together. You can have parents that, you know, religiously had family time and, you know, took you to do fun things because they decided that was the right thing to do. But there's also this really constricting feeling sometimes in the presence of a self-righteous narcissist because not only do they hold themselves to their impossible moralistic worldview, but they also hold you to this worldview. And remember, all narcissism is on a spectrum. So we go from healthy to pathological narcissism on the spectrum, and there are all different shades of this self-righteous narcissism along this spectrum. So if you recognize some or all of these traits in your parents or in yourself or in your spouse, know that that doesn't necessarily mean that they are a pathological narcissist or a clinical narcissist. They may have, you know, some of those traits in the middle, and maybe they only show up in certain occasions. And this is just information to get curious with so we can understand why we behave the way we do and why we're not getting what we want. We wouldn't be listening to this podcast if we were 100% happy with the way our lives are going. We're trying to make sense of things. We're trying to heal. This is information for healing, not for judgment. Now, if this sounds like someone you know, even if that person is your former religious self, stay tuned. We'll discuss more about why these behaviors can attract us. Why did we like these behaviors in the first place? how religion cultivates these patterns, and if we're recognizing these self-righteous traits in our former religious self or even in our current self, how we can begin to release ourselves from the claws of self-righteous narcissistic thinking. Now, before we go any further in this episode, I have a quick ask of you. If you feel this podcast is helping you understand and accept yourself better, and if you feel these resources should be amplified so that more people have access to them as they deconstruct high-demand religion and family trauma, pause this podcast right now and head over to emancipateyourmind.org and make a $10 donation, or keep listening, and I'll walk you through it. Go to emancipateyourmind.org. The donation area is up on the right-hand side at the top of the page under the words, support the podcast and give a gift. Please click the monthly donation button if you'd like to automatically fund the research and broadcast each month so we can make sure everyone that is healing from religious trauma, or specifically in this case, religious narcissistic abuse, has access to the tools and support they need to thrive. One of the biggest roadblocks that keeps us from thriving 
after we have experienced narcissistic abuse is the gaslighting. Feeling like we're crazy, that what we're seeing actually isn't what we're seeing. Often just needing someone to say, this is what it looks like and you're not crazy can help us begin to like settle into the reality of whether or not this person I was interacting with was somewhere in the middle or all the way at pathology, there were some traits and behaviors that came out that left me feeling wounded. And that gets to be valid. Whether they agree or they don't agree, your experience is valid. There are people, I'm sure, that interacted with me at some of my worst moments in high demand religion that probably thought I was a raging clinical narcissist. That was their experience of me. And they get to hold that view of me. And they get to set boundaries and protect themselves from the person I was in my interaction with them. That gets to be okay. This is where holding ourselves comes into play. Now, I know I'm not a clinical narcissist because I can be accountable and I'm trying so hard to be self-aware, but I still hurt people occasionally. There are things that are still hidden subconsciously from me and I do create harm sometimes. And without a conversation where we can resolve conflict, guess what? There are people I'm sure that still sometimes would believe I'm narcissistic and that's okay. This is where it really comes back to doing the work with ourselves, to really rooting into the fact that we have worth. Regardless of how much healing there is still yet to do, we have worth and value. As a person, we're worthy of love and belonging. We are worthy of having a voice and being heard. We're worthy of taking up space. We're worthy of existing. And when we do that work, as we allow ourselves to feel safe with us, it becomes easier to allow others to have differing opinions. Because if you do have someone with a lot of narcissistic traits in your life, they'll accuse you of being the narcissist when it's their own narcissistic traits coming up. So rooting into this is really helpful in allowing us to accept that our perspectives are valid, our feelings are valid, and it allows us to be able to feel safe and protected even when we have people in our lives that believe bad things about us. I know this is a difficult principle and it often takes professional help. So this is something that's really hard for you as it is for many of us. I've used professional help. I still use professional help in order to identify and work through my own wounds. I highly recommend, if you can, getting the help you need to hold yourself with kindness so you can move forward. We talk about narcissism a lot right now on the app in the weekly call. I have an app called the Emancipate Yourself app. If you need some inexpensive support and help please go to the Emancipate Yourself app. It's on Google and Apple, and it's $39.99 a month or something like that. We have a weekly group call. There are a lot of people in the group call right now working through narcissistic abuse with either spouses or with parents. And we're talking about setting boundaries, and we're talking about whatever the people in the group need to talk about. If you would like that support, if you need that validation, if going to therapy is out of the question right now, either because all of your therapists are booked, which is happening a lot right now, or because it's too expensive, that's the whole reason I created the app. There's also two courses that are going to walk you through learning to trust yourself, learning to know who you are and how to create a safe space and a safe relationship with yourself. So if you need that, please head over there. Do it right now. Sign up. There's a seven-day free trial, and we would love to have you in the calls. Videos are off. Microphones are off. If you don't want to speak even, you don't have to use your real name. Just we're on Zoom, so change your name on Zoom if you don't want your real name to be used. I would love to support you in that way. All right, let's dig into some of these narcissistic attitudes and behaviors in self-righteous narcissists and how they show up. 
The first one we're going to talk about is grandiosity. At the root of grandiosity is believing not only that you're special, believing that you're special is okay. But when you begin to believe that you are specialer than either all or most of the population, that's when it becomes a problem. When it comes to self-righteous narcissism, you believe that you are more moral or correct than other people. This is the way you're more special is you're just a little bit more righteous or a lot more righteous. You are more connected to God. You are chosen. You are the elite. You're going to the celestial kingdom, highest degree of the celestial kingdom. And isn't that sad that all these other people won't get to go there? This is going to be a vulnerable episode because the person I have the most experience with and I know both the overt ways I showed up as well as the covert beliefs and emotions and perspectives I had inside of me, Mm. I'm going to be talking to you about my own experience with these three kinds of narcissism that are coming up. I don't identify with the last one we'll be talking about as much as these next two, but self-righteous narcissism was and sometimes still is a problem for me. I mean, I remember thinking like in this like little smug way inside of myself, how lucky I was to be raised in my church and have the truth. That's a self-righteous, narcissistic idea. I remember preaching to people in a way like I wrote a letter to my aunt one time who was looking for some answers in her life. I wrote her this letter when I was like 23 or something like that, fresh out of Brigham Young University, telling her that when she opened her eyes to the truth, y'all, I was an asshole, when she opened her eyes to the truth then things would get better in her life. Like this feeling that I had it all figured out at 23 and that I would impart graciously this wisdom to her and save her life is such a self-righteous, narcissistic attitude. And my guess is if you came from high demand religion, you were almost trained and molded to kind of have some of these attitudes. You might not have been as far along on the spectrum as I was, But you likely had some of these attitudes of I'm lucky or special because I belong to this religion. I found the truth. And isn't it sad that other people don't have the truth like I do? And I'm supposed to save them. I'm supposed to teach them what I know. It's my responsibility to make them see the world the way I see the world and to come to the truth. So... I was maybe a little bit further along that spectrum. I think I was well past the middle and headed towards that unhealthy side when I was in high demand religion. And the longer I was in, the more ingrained those traits became and the uglier I feel like it got inside of myself because me inside of me that wanted to be empathic and kind and loving was almost fighting against this box of but I'm supposed to share the gospel and this is the truth and I have to be perfect. As my perfectionism got more constricting, my judgment got bigger. Oh, that was hard to say. It's really hard, especially coming from this place where narcissism really covered a lot of my internalized shame. It's really hard to be in this place sometimes where you open up and let people see the ugly parts because there's still that high demand religious girl. She's still a part of me. Like she's still inside. She's healing. But that wants to like cover up and put on a mask and be like, no, I'm wonderful. So that was really hard to say out loud, but you're going to hear a lot more. So if it's hard for you to admit, even to yourself, I just want you to know you're not alone. Part of the reason I'm sharing this way is because I'm hoping that by taking off some of my armor, not only will I be able to better hold myself and work through my my own still internalized shame because there's still some of that in there, but that you'll feel less alone and you'll feel safe enough to do that for yourself. Now, I've got a couple of examples from mostly Christian doctrine here, but also Mormon doctrine 
that can be used to support grandiosity. A lot of people will use the scriptures or words of leaders or prophets or pastors to support this idea of grandiosity. And I feel like I need to say this again. I understand that these scriptures can be read multiple ways. They can be read in ways that are healthy. That's really hard for me to see because I did not interpret these scriptures this way when I was in the faith. But I do know people who interpret Bible passages in a much healthier way than I did. However, I know I'm not a special snowflake. I'm not some unicorn. If I interpreted these passages this way, there are others who interpreted these passages this way and use them to excuse grandiosity inside of themselves. One of these scriptures is Matthew twenty two fourteen. I know there are scriptorians out there that are saying this from the top of their head as well. Many are called, but few are chosen. This idea that everyone is called into the kingdom, but only those who lay down everything for their faith will be chosen to do the work. It created for me this sense of perfectionism or obsession with following the faith perfectly so that I could be chosen by God. Because perfection is not possible, we often feel like imposters or we worry that we're not enough, which causes us to look around and see how we compare to others, which sets the stage for this kind of narcissism. In fact, they've recently done a study and found that people with this sort of spiritual elitism and this moralistic view of life, they wanted to know if these people felt like they were better than others. Like, did they see themselves as more good or did they see themselves as less evil? And the study found that people want to see themselves as less evil than others because we all know we're not perfect. So it's impossible for us to carry around this feeling of I'm more good because it's that golden child problem that we have when we're told that we're exceptional, when we're told that we're chosen, when we're told that we're God's elite. We believe it for a short time, but then we begin to feel imposter syndrome because we're going to mess up. We all have our small mistakes and failings and weaknesses and, and coping patterns and childhood trauma. We all have these things. And because we can't feel comfortable that we're perfect, we at least want to see that we're less flawed than others. And that's where this like Karen attitude comes from. Whether it's externalized, whether it's overt, and we're the Karen that's yelling at people in the grocery store, or we're online spewing hate, or whether it's more internalized like mine was, kind to everyone on the outside, performative on the outside, and on the inside feeling justified because I was at least better than other people in certain ways. And I was constantly judging my sense of failing and weakness against other people's sense of failing and weakness. So when we get into these perfectionistic patterns, when the imposter syndrome sets in because we realize that we're not perfect and we're so afraid someone's going to figure that out, that we're not one of the chosen, that we're amongst all these other people wearing their perfect masks and we just don't fit. We do not want anyone to recognize that we're the imposter. And so we comfort that fear inside of ourselves by looking and being like, okay, well, their child is going off the deep end, but my kids are perfectly little obedient angels. Or, oh, she's wearing a short skirt and I can see the bottom of her garments, but mine goes down to my calves. Or whatever is the stupid, petty things that we start focusing on so that we feel better about ourselves. This is what leads to that Karen behavior is this deep sense of insecurity that we cover by judging others. Because like this study says, and I'm going to put the study in the show notes if you want to go view it yourself, but like this study found, people want to feel less evil because we can't strive for more good because we're all aware of our weaknesses and flaws. Other scriptures that can be used this way, enter ye in at the straight gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat. 
because straight is the gate and narrow the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. So this is Matthew 7, 13 through 14. And it's this idea that only a few people, do you hear the elitism? Only a few people are chosen, are elite, get to be with God and get to have eternal life. And for people who came from a Mormon background, I mean, it's like a narcissistic dream. What does a narcissist want? They want unlimited power, success, wealth, the highest degree of the celestial kingdom. If you're a man, promises you unlimited wives, which also means unlimited sex because LDS people believe that there is sex or at least reproduction in the afterlife. So unlimited sex with unlimited women. I mean, you're telling this to sexually repressed people. Like unlimited pleasure if you will just suffer and be moralistic right now. So, so seductive to somebody who leans towards perfectionism, who leans towards this legalism and this certainty and this rigidity, especially if you're male. But even this idea that You would live in a mansion. I mean, for me, who grew up in a trailer house, living in a mansion sounded amazing. I mean, my family on Sundays, we used to drive around and look at all of the big houses on the lake. And we used to look at, you know, their landscaping and what the rock work on their house would look like and just the location and their view and This is what we did for fun was looked at other people's big, beautiful houses. So for me, the idea that I'd get to live in a mansion sounded amazing. The idea that I would get to create worlds, which so sad after I became ex-Mormon, realized that was not a thing. Like women don't get to create worlds, only the men do. So that was highly disappointing. But when I was in the religion, I thought that I would get to create worlds. And I would daydream about the worlds I would create and rule over. So this idea of unlimited power for both men and women, a little bit better for you men in these high demand fundamentalist religions, whether they're Christianity, Judaism, or Islam, tends to be better for the men than the women. But this idea of unlimited power in the afterlife was super seductive to someone with a self-righteous narcissism. And I was just reading a story the other day that someone posted. They were talking about a Facebook post they had read after Hurricane Sandy. And a man had posted a photo of himself standing in front of his perfectly preserved house and the destroyed remnants of his neighbor's house with the caption, The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. Proverbs 3.33. And this is such a good example of overt self-righteous narcissism. Remember, overt is what we can see and observe. We can see this picture of this smug man standing in front of his perfectly preserved house while his neighbor's hopes and dreams are scattered all over the grass, saying that his home was preserved because he was more righteous or at least less evil than his neighbor and that God chose to protect him. Because God is his BFF, but destroyed his neighbor's house because his neighbor wasn't good enough. And we see this all over social media. Now, on the other hand, grandiosity is often seen in deconstruction, spiritual and secular spaces as well. When we believe that we're smarter or better than others because we're living the quote unquote right way, and when we believe all others should believe and behave the way we do, and we're harsh in our judgments of them when they don't, we're participating in self righteous grandiosity. And this is going to be hard to hear, but it's something I needed to hear a couple of years ago as well. I left Mormonism believing I had become a better person, that I'd become smarter, that I had become more informed, more empathic, kinder, which I had to everyone outside of Mormonism. All the people I was told to other, I definitely became more tolerant, accepting, kind, empathic, and compassionate to. 
But now the others were the people who were still in Mormonism. So I left Mormonism and I considered myself a much more kind, compassionate, and tolerant person because I now had this wide group of people that I could listen to and get curious with that I used to judge the hell out of, but I didn't quit judging. I just turned that on the people who were still in the Mormon church. And so now my in-group was anyone who wasn't in the Mormon church, and my out-group was anyone who was still in. And I felt better or like I was living the right way because I left and I used to judge everyone that was still in. This self-righteous narcissism didn't leave me simply because I left the Mormon church. It was something I had to become aware of and begin to deconstruct inside of myself. And I did that by first sitting with a professional who allowed me to recognize that I am worthy even while I have these traits inside of me. We can't heal narcissism by shaming people because narcissistic behavior is covering shame. I needed someone who could help me feel worthy and enough, could help me recognize that in myself so that I could release these narcissistic traits that were protecting that shame. So often when we have narcissists or people with high narcissistic tendencies in our life, what we try to do is we try to shame them out of that behavior. We call them out publicly. We humiliate them. We make them feel less than. We we dehumanize them. And it actually makes them dig down further into their narcissistic behavior. It actually makes it harder for us to heal those parts of ourselves as well. So In the ex-Mormon, ex-Christian, ex-Muslim spaces, I get it because we have trauma, right? And we have anger and we're grieving. It's so tempting to want to turn that judgment on the people who are judging us. It's so tempting to want to fight fire with fire. But we can't fight shame with shame. It does not work. It actually makes it worse. So it's better to focus on healing ourselves so that their judgment doesn't hurt as much and so that we can create boundaries around what we'll tolerate and what we won't. And if you're having trouble setting boundaries with a narcissist, I did an episode back in, I think, March or April about that. It's literally setting boundaries with a narcissist. So go check that out if setting boundaries is something that's difficult. Now, in these spaces outside of high-demand religion, grandiosity can look like the deconstruction coach or spiritual guru that sets themselves up as an authority in your life for the best way or the only way to be free of religious trauma or to find enlightenment. If someone says this is a way, or this is one of many ways, or I'm going to tell you what worked for me, but you decide for yourself, that's safe. But if someone says, follow me, this is the way, this is the only way, this is the best way, run. Another way this can show up is believing you're better than others because you're woke and even criticizing or judging others harshly for their... Uh, what term do I want to use here? Um, unwokeness? Anti-wokeness? I don't know. Asleepedness? You get the picture. But even Barack Obama pointed this out in a BBC interview in 2019 saying... I get a sense among certain young people on social media that the way of making change is to be as judgmental as possible about other people. If I tweet or hashtag about how you didn't do something right or you used the wrong verb, then I can sit back and feel pretty good about myself because, man, did you see how woke I was? I totally called you out. This idea of purity. Hmm. This has given me a different way of looking at purity culture, but we'll get to that later. This idea of purity and you're never compromised and you're politically woke and all that stuff, you should get over that quickly. The world is messy. There are ambiguities. People who do really good stuff still have flaws. We are human. Every single one of us has some childhood trauma. We all have things that we are working through. We all have protective behaviors to kind of cover and protect those wounds. 
There is none of us that is purely quote unquote woke. We are not better than others. And the comparison is where we're really getting into these self righteous narcissistic traits. And again, if you're feeling triggered, if you're feeling called out, I'm not meaning to call you out. I'm calling myself out, I'm calling who I used to be out, I'm calling who I still can be occasionally out. And if you're feeling called out, pause. Care for yourself. That means getting curious. No judgment. What's underneath this trigger? What are your feelings? What are your emotions? What are they trying to tell you? You can be angry at me. That's okay. As I'm speaking, if you're feeling anger, that's all right. Get curious with it. I'm a big girl. I can handle people being angry at me. Anger is good. It tells you things about yourself and your reality. If you're feeling ashamed, sit with it. What is the shame saying? What is it afraid of? What do you need to feel safe? Sit with yourself and listen to what it's trying to tell you that you need. Allow it to express itself to you. All right, the next trait we're going to talk about is moralism. Having a set of values that you live your life by is healthy. That's what helps us feel like we're being true to ourselves when our inner values line up with our outward language and behavior. So having values and living by those values actually helps us feel like we're in alignment. That is not a bad thing. We cross the line into moralism, however, when we apply those values and beliefs to others and believe they should live their lives by them and then judge them harshly when they don't. This kind of behavior is domineering. We try to force others to live according to our beliefs, values, and sense of right and wrong. We preach at others because we believe our way of looking at the world is the right way and because we have the truth. Their consent to this preaching doesn't matter because we feel we know better than they do. This kind of, you should listen to my authority on this topic because my way is the right way attitude can be seen in all areas of life. You'll see people that will preach on the diet we should eat. Some of the diet cultures, you guys, out there, they're almost cult-like. You might see people talking about the right way to exercise. How to feed your infant, what the right way is or the responsible way is. Whether or not to get immunizations. Homeschool or public school or charter school or private school or religious school. Best business practices, like the only right way to run an online business or the only right way to network. If it's a topic that rouses big emotions, there will be self-righteous narcissism in the arena. Of course, this is going to include religion, spirituality, and everything related to those topics. Another characteristic of self-righteous narcissism is fundamentalism. The more fundamentalist someone is with their beliefs, the more likely they are to venture into the realm of self-righteous narcissism. Fundamentalism, in the simplest terms, is an unwavering attachment to a set of beliefs. It relies heavily on dogma. So dogma is a set of principles or rules that can't be questioned and is followed no matter what. When I was talking with my 15-year-old about this idea, I was researching a few weeks ago and we were sitting in the car waiting for band practice to start. And he was like, what are you studying? I was listening to a podcast and he goes, what What are we talking about? And so I paused the podcast and I was talking with him about dogma and I was talking with him about fundamentalism and I was talking with him about like legalism. And he said this kind of narcissist reminded him of a character in a movie he loved as a child. In Pixar's WALL-E, there's a robotic character named Otto. He's the autopilot on this huge vessel that's carrying the last of humanity. He's initially depicted much like a self-righteous narcissist before the bigger red flags come to light. He's collected, emotionless, firm, responsible. He can be trusted. Everybody relies on him. 
and feels as though he is the protector of the remaining human race. So responsible, right? Adulting has all of their ducks in a row. Looks like they've got their stuff together. Reliable. You can trust this person to do what they say they're going to do. However, Otto becomes the villain when later in the movie, he becomes a desperate and temperamental control freak because he can't defy his programming that was written 700 years prior by humans that thought the Earth would never be inhabitable again. So that fact is proven wrong. Times had changed. A plant was growing in a boot. And even though the evidence and facts were right in front of him, he would not or could not go against his programming. So there's a plant. It's obvious that things have changed on Earth. Life is starting to grow again. But Otto won't look at the facts. In fact, he tries to destroy the facts. And he tries to destroy Ava, who found the facts and is trying to protect this plant. And tries to destroy all of humanity with it. Like, he becomes this very destructive robot because new evidence is threatening his existing programming and beliefs. And this is how a self-righteous narcissist holds to their beliefs rigidly, robotically, against reason and evidence, even if it will harm people they care about. They often will get aggressive or destructive in your relationship if you challenge their moralistic beliefs because it feels so threatening to their programming and that programming is there to protect their wounds that leave them feeling insecure or like an imposter or like they're not good enough. And in order to protect the purity of their beliefs, they will dismiss or discard any other opinions, perspectives, or beliefs to protect themselves from the possibility of considering those ideas. And they do this through harsh judgment and mockery. So it's a defensive mechanism of their brain. When new ideas come in, they will either be really judgmental of those ideas or they'll mock them, um, ridicule them. And sometimes what will happen is they'll discard or disown the people who bring these alternate opinions, perspectives, or beliefs into their life. The cancel culture can be really strong with this subset of narcissistic traits. It can be really threatening to have a child or a partner or a parent that goes against this rigid moralistic thinking of right versus wrong that has no flexibility. Now, I've painted these people as kind of perfectionistic, judgmental, robotic, cold people. And at the far end of the spectrum, they can definitely feel that way. So what attracts us to these traits in the first place? If we were raised with parents we couldn't rely on, who were unpredictable or irresponsible, we're often highly attracted to these kinds of narcissistic traits. So if you had an alcoholic father or if you had a mother that was like never home or kind of neglected you or if you were in a relationship with somebody who cheated on you or somebody who is really irresponsible financially, you may be attracted to somebody who is a self-righteous narcissist because they look responsible. They follow through. They do what they say they're going to do. They're loyal They will show up for you. They will do what they say they're going to do in your life. They keep their promises. However, it becomes problematic because the box that they create for themselves and for you continues to restrict and get tighter and tighter and tighter until you feel like you're squished to death and that there is no wiggle room. The other way that we embrace these traits is when we were raised by others who exhibited these traits or who told us that these traits were desirable. So we become the people that have internalized narcissistic traits when we believe this is the way good people behave and are taught, either through our caregivers' words or actions. And we're told that this kind of rigid adherence to moralistic rules is the only way to get acceptance and validation. So if we're raised in a very fundamentalist society, And the way to show that we're devoted is to have this outward rigidity 
this outward moralism, the preachiness even, is sometimes praised and admired. And a lot of times people with the self-righteous moralism, they're the ones that get the higher positions at church. They're raised up. They are sometimes worshipped. These are the people that become cult leaders when self-righteous narcissism is matched with malignancy. But even in organizations that wouldn't be considered a cult per se, but maybe more of a strict religion or a high demand religion, it's the people that show these kinds of traits outwardly that are often lifted up into positions of respect, admiration, and power. And so we often have that held up for us as what we're trying to achieve. The other thing that can happen is sometimes we get in relationships with these kinds of people when we come from high demand religion, because those kinds of people are held up on a pedestal and we're told that adherence to the religion is the most important thing. Sometimes we'll look for a spouse that has these traits because outwardly they look incredibly devoted and loyal to the church. And they often are incredibly loyal and devoted to the church to a fault where they will not think outside of what they've been told is the right way to think. And they can be very robotic and dogmatic and unbending in their observance of their religious rites. But we're told that that's a sign of righteousness, that that's a sign of devotion. And so sometimes we take on spouses that look like this in order to feel secure that we've chosen a spouse that will devote themselves to the religion which we've been told is the most important thing. Now, if we find these behaviors inside of ourselves, we've already talked about how that doesn't mean anything about our worthiness. This is one of the ways that we are trying to protect childhood wounds or wounds from previous relationships This is a way that we're trying to make ourselves feel safe. But once we become aware of these traits, once we become aware that we're showing up in these ways, here are four things we can do to begin creating some wiggle room in our life to start getting out of these patterns. The first one is get curious. You guys are going to hear me say this, I feel like, in every podcast. Get curious with why you feel you need to be right. What does being right do for your sense of self-worth? What would happen if you weren't right? Journal this if you want. Take some time. Write everything that comes to mind. Or just allow yourself to think about it and maybe voice message yourself throughout the day as you have realizations Or if you're a verbal processor like me and you have somebody who's willing to just listen as you process, see if somebody would be willing to sit with you while you process this. The second thing to do would be care for that part of you that feels unsafe to be wrong. What is it most afraid of? What would help that part of you feel safer to make mistakes or to accept new information? Again, give yourself what you need to feel safe. The third thing is become a lifelong student. When you notice yourself feeling certain your way is the right way, consciously stop and ask yourself, if I acted like I knew nothing about this, if I had no previous programming on this topic, what might I learn that I would miss if I came in as the expert? This has been perhaps one of the most helpful tools that I've engaged in as a person who is recovering from self-righteous narcissistic traits, reminding myself to be the student. If I put away what I think I know, what could I still learn? And along with that is getting a different perspective because sometimes I'm like, okay, well, I've seen this issue from this perspective. What if I took the opposite perspective or an alternate perspective? So number four is get a different perspective. If I find myself feeling really certain about something like I'm right and other people are wrong, I will intentionally, once I become aware of that, I will intentionally go and find somebody with a different perspective or point of view. And I will talk with them about their different outlooks. 
with the intention to listen to fully understand where they're coming from. I'm not there to convince them to think differently, but to simply practice holding space for and learning to hear and understand others who have different perspectives than I do. So come as a student asking yourself, what could I learn if I pretended I didn't have any previous programming? Like, how can I set aside my bias? How can I set aside what I think I know and listen with new ears? And then if I still am like, I am right, if I get in that stubborn place of this is the way it should be, I will intentionally talk to other people who I know have different perspectives. This can be helpful with politics, with religion, with breastfeeding, with immunizations, with diet culture, with business practices, sitting and talking with someone who thinks differently than I do, has opened my eyes, has challenged my thinking, has allowed me, if nothing else, to be more open-minded and generous in my assumptions of people, and has allowed me to get away from judgment. There are times I have these conversations that I feel like I fully understand the other person. They feel fully understood because I ask them, like, am I hearing this right? This is what I heard you say. Help me make sure that I'm understanding you correctly. And when we get to a place where they say, yeah, that's exactly what I mean. When I get to that place where I fully understand them, sometimes I still don't agree. Sometimes I agree with a few things and sometimes my thinking completely changes. All of those are acceptable outcomes. The point of the conversation is not to convince them and not to be convinced. It's simply to hold space for listening to other perspectives and reminding ourselves that we can survive them. The point is to have more empathy and understanding and tolerance. It's to open ourselves up to more perspectives. And that alone will help us begin to dissolve these self-righteous traits and thought patterns and behavior patterns. I know I've already made a couple of asks of you in this podcast, but I have one more ask. Many of us don't know what self-righteous narcissism looks like in daily life because it may have been the entire culture we were raised with and it just feels like normal. So I'm going to be putting up a post on Sunday morning on the Emancipate Yourself Facebook group. The name of the post is going to be Stories from a Self-Righteous Narcissist. And I want you to write a comment with a story you can think of about self-righteous behavior you've observed in someone you know or yourself. It can be in a religious or other setting. And you can submit without telling us who the person was and keep it anonymous. You do not have to do what I've done today and admit that this was you if you don't feel comfortable doing that or admit that it's somebody that you you know, know and love. But what is a self-righteous behavior that you have observed and tell the story in a way that demonstrates what that behavior looks like? If possible, do it without judgment. It's a good practice for us because often those of us who have self-righteous narcissists that we're in relationship with, we can be self-righteous right back with them. We fight fire with fire sometimes. So self-righteous narcissists have a tendency to breed more self-righteous narcissists. But what I want to do is I want to catalog as many examples as we can so we can become more aware of what this behavior looks like in real life. Get creative if you want. If you know of a story in like a newspaper or something you've seen on Facebook or even like something from a celebrity's life or just an example that comes to mind, something scriptural if you want. There are examples of self-righteous narcissism in many books of scripture. So if you want to point out something from scripture, something from a sermon, um, something from daily life, your own life, your own relationships, anything. It's all welcome. This post is simply to catalog what self-righteous narcissism looks like in real time so that it's easier for us to recognize it in ourselves and in others so that we can address them, heal them, and just make the world a little safer for ourselves and others. Thank you so much for joining me today. I cannot wait to continue to talk about these subsets of narcissism with you. I'm learning a lot. And these subsets of narcissism 
are actually only beginning to be researched. So this is fun. We get to kind of contribute to the content that's out there about self-righteous narcissism and the other two subsets that we'll be talking about in the upcoming weeks. So it's going to be exciting. Thank you again for joining me today, and I will see you next Sunday.